This conference will now be recorded. And um, in terms of how we're going to run this webinar, um, as I mentioned before, if you can just uh, mute your microphone if you're not Resit, uh, and then uh, uh, and then we'll we'll take questions as we go through. If you if you have a question you want to ask to sort of clarify something that Resit has said, then then if you can write your comment into the chat box. I will be look, keeping an eye on that. And if it's something that I can answer, then I'll answer you back. Um, if it's a particular question, then we'll, we'll hold it to a relevant point uh, in, in the talk uh, so that you can then ask. So we don't have to wait till the end of the talk, um, but we'll, we'll just queue them up at a, a logical point. So use the chat box for that. Um, if at the end of the talk, we've then got some time left for questions, we can do a combination of using the chat box if that works for you, or we can also use the microphones and all you need to do is just put your microphone on green and then I will, I will um, say to you, okay, Alana, do you want to have a talk, do you want to talk now or whoever it might be? And then we'll just queue them up that way just so we, we have some order to it. But um, all of you, thank you very much for, for joining us for this webinar as a sort of an overview to the, the, the green list process. And this sits within uh, a series of webinars that CPSG is running that are relevant to uh, species conservation planning, but going beyond um, the, the areas that perhaps CPSG uh, spends most of its time focusing on uh, so that we can we learn from it as well as hopefully that learning being shared more widely. And I'm delighted that um, Professor Rezit Akchakaya um, from Stony Brook University and the IUCN Species Survival Commission is able to, to join us and, and to give up his time to give us this overview on the green list and some of the connections between this process and, uh, uh, and planning. And I'm sure there'll be some questions that will come out in, in relation to that. Um, I think this is this is a work in progress, and so it's a great time to be uh, be hearing about what stage we've got to. So, uh, Resit, do you want to start uh, um, by having your webcam on, and perhaps you can do your own introduction, and then take the camera off, and then we can get started with the presentation. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a, it's a um, great opportunity to talk to you about. Uh, about Green List. Um, I'm Reshit Akçakaya and I'm a professor at Stonebrook University, which is part of the New York State University system. On, on, and I, I am based in, in Long Island, New York. Um, I have also been involved in the Red List uh, for a long time, uh, for 20 years actually now. And um, currently I'm on the Red List Committee and I have also been chairing the Standards and Petitions Committee of Red List for a long time. Um, more recently, I am uh, a member of the Green List Task Force and um, I'll be um, mostly talking about today about uh, our efforts to make Green List a new um, knowledge product for IUCN. Uh, but I'll start with um, a brief um, uh, uh, a brief discussion about the red list. Um, so I'll now close my webcam so you can see the, the slides. Um, as you know, the, one of the main goals of conservation science has been preventing extinctions. Um, of course, doing this requires knowing which species are headed towards extinction and also knowing this sufficient warning time so that conservation measures can get started and the species has time to respond to these conservation measures. Um, so the, the warning time needs to be longer than the latency time and, and the response time. Um, like many conservation scientists, most of my work has focused on extinctions. Um, in my case, this involved developing methods and models to predict extinctions so that they can be prevented. I would like to think that we have been fairly successful in this, although there is still a lot to do. Um, for instance, we have demonstrated that we can not only predict extinctions, but, but we can predict them with sufficient warning time. Um, the main um, system we use for these predictions is the IUCN Red List. And 
Uh, and what we have demonstrated is that the red list works well in predicting extinctions with a sufficient warning time, even with relatively unknown threats like climate change. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that work, uh, but I'll just mention that as chair of the Red List Standards and Petitions Committee, I have heard many complaints about the Red List in, in, in the 20 years that I've been doing this. And in, in most cases, these result from misunderstandings and misconceptions, and we try to correct these by developing more detailed guidelines. But some of the complaints actually um, do have a point, and they point out to the inadequacy of not the Red List, but of using extinction risk as the only metric of conservation status or conservation concern. Now, for example, <clears throat> there are many species that are improving and that have a lower risk of extinction because of conservation. Now, when this improvement results in a lower red list category, it sometimes becomes controversial. And instead of celebrating the success, conservationists are worried that improvement will lead to lower conservation efforts. So the problem here is not the red list itself, but the fact that red list measures extinction risk, which does not capture the degree to which these species depend on conservation. Um, and then there are species that are not at risk of extinction, but they are safe only in a fraction of their former range. Um, these, uh, this uh, is, for instance, the saltwater crocodile that has some uh, populations, uh, for instance, in Australia that are uh, relatively safe from extinction, but, but the other populations are either threatened or actually have been extirpated. Other populations are either threatened or actually have been extirpated. Um, by the way, can I pause for a minute to ask that everyone um, 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 mute their microphones because I'm hearing myself. Okay, thank you. Um, so, such these kind of species may be least concerned on the red list, like like this one is, but we cannot really consider them to be recovered. And and the the point here is that the extinction risk does not capture the conservation concern we have for such depleted populations, even if they are at, at low risk of extinction. And then there are also species that are not at risk of extinction, but they are considered ecologically extinct or functionally extinct. These uh, are species with populations that are reduced to such low densities or such sparse distributions that they do not fulfill their ecological functions. And um, American bison is an is a interesting example of this. Obviously, American bison is a great success story. Um, it has been um, um, it has been at the brink of extinction, and now it is not at risk of extinction. Um, but we still cannot um, consider this species recovered because it is at such low density that it is not performing its functions that it used to do in the in the Great Plains of North America. Uh, functions such as uh, creation of landscape heterogeneity through grazing and wallowing nutrient uh, redistribution or or creation creation of habitat for many other species like uh, butterflies grassland birds prairie dogs and, and other species um, so all of these examples um, they point to um, the, the the fact that extinction risk while perhaps the most important conservation metric it's not the only relevant conservation metric and, and the reason, of course, is that avoiding extinctions is not enough. We want species recovered. Um, but what is recovery? Um, recovery is not defined in a consistent way, and this uh, creates problems. Um, for instance, it creates problems in terms of setting recovery targets, which, of course, as you all know, is a critical step of the conservation planning process. However, it's not standardized. Um, this data is coming from a paper that analyze the recovery targets of species listed under the United States Endangered Species Act. And what the paper showed is that um, for many species, the recovery target level is at or below the current number of individuals or current number of populations. So you can see that for about 
15% of species, the target level is below the current number of individuals. And for 20% of species, the target level of populations is below the current level. Um, and and this, this demonstrates the problem that uh, when there are no objective, practical, ambitious de de uh, definition of recovery, um, we have these inconsistent results. Now, such a definition is difficult because of the fundamental difference between extinct and recovered. Extinct is a well-defined state, but recovered is not. And there's also some degree of confusion of concepts related to recovery. So um, for our first Greenlist meeting that I attended, I thought about the, the, the concept of recovery. And I went through many, many papers written on that. And I made a list. I made a list of all the concepts and methods and other terms that have been used in the literature related to recovery and population targets. Now, at the meeting, we went through all of these concepts. We discussed them at length. And we noticed that uh, there are different types of concepts here. First, uh, there are some, such as extinction risk, that are related to the goals of recovery. Um, we cannot consider a species to be recovered if, if it has a high extinction risk. So one of the things we want is that extinction risk should be low. And then there are other concepts that are uh, pretty much the same concept, same related concept. Resilience and viability are the opposite of extinction risk. And they are also referring to the goals of recovery. Um, and then there are other terms, such as redundancy and, and replicated populations, that refer to how we achieve these goals, ways of achieving uh, goals of, for instance, viability. Um, and then there are other terms uh, about methods that, that we use or metrics that we use. And so sorting through all of these at this, um, at this workshop, we came up with um, three dimensions of viability. We said that, uh, oh, sorry, three dimensions of recovery. We said that viability is, um, the minimum requirement. The, the, we, we need species to have a low risk of extinction to be considered recovered. But this is not a, this is a require, required, but not sufficient. Um, we also said uh, that functionality is another dimension, um, that the species has to fill, fulfill its role or function in the ecosystem. And then, and I'll go through this, um, uh, the, these concepts in. Um, more detail in a bit. And the final dimension we um, considered is representation. Uh, we said that a species should occur in a representative set of ecosystems throughout its native range. In other words, it's not sufficient that a species is safe, let's say in one national park, that it's not going to go extinct there and it's functional, but it's all of, the, all of its range. It has to be um, existing in all the different ecological settings and ecosystems that it is it is naturally part of. So based on these three dimensions, and by the way, I want to mention that these are not new concepts that we came up with. These are um, uh, concepts and, and dimensions of recovery that people have thought about and, and wrote about a lot. Uh, but based on these, uh, we defined a recovered state. We said that a species is fully recovered if it is viable and ecologically functional in every part of its indigenous and projected range. Um, I think this is a um, key development. Uh, it has the potential to become an uh, objective and standard definition of um, uh, recovery. Um, but of course, there are all these all these terms that has to be worked on and, and that have to be um, defined. So I'll um, just to make the, the this this part clear. Um, I'll go through each of these terms and explain why we include them and what we mean by them. Uh, but before I do that, are there any any questions at this point? <laughs> I'm just having, uh, Rizid, I'm just looking at the, the chat room and, and, and it's okay for now. I, I did, maybe it's a bit of an unfair question, maybe it's one that would come out it's better for later on, but if I leave this with you, that, that one, one point that your the presentation is making me think about is, you know, extinction, at least 
in its crudest sense, the most fundamental sense is, you know, it's not there anymore. Okay, so that's, um, we, it's fairly, it's, it's more straightforward to be able to define that. And I just wonder when we get towards recovery, it feels like we're starting to move into values. Um, uh, and so, and I, I'm just wondering whether there is this, whether you see this tension in terms of trying to create an objective um, definition of recovered, when it when when obviously you're then putting a boundary around what is recovered and what is not yet some at the moment there's obviously there's freedom for people to say well this to me is what recovered means and this because this reflects my values so i wonder where in the in the in your discussion around you know viable functional and representative whether you did spend or you have spent time thinking about um how much of this is a values judgment as opposed to, you know, something um, more um, perhaps colder or more, you know, more objective. Um, did you have you did you have that sort of conversation around these pick, when picking these three aspects? Um, yes, actually, we, we did um, discuss these issues. It's a it's a good question. Um, the, the the but there are different um, levels of it. First, um, let me say that the same thing was um, the, an issue for the Red List as well. Before the Red List criteria came to be used uh, in the 1980s and uh, uh, until the early 90s, um, whether a species was a, a threat or rare or all of these concepts were rather con uh, confused, right? Rarity versus threat wasn't differentiated from each other. And that also was kind of a value judgment. Um, and then it, and, and then we define extinction risk as a very specific metric, and then do all criteria around it. Um, now, recovery is not exactly like that. I don't think it will ever be, and there will always be a not. I wouldn't call it value judgment, but I would call it a um, difference in degree of ambition of how much to recover the species. And we did consider that, and and. And, and we can discuss it um, later after my talk. Um, but but first, I think it's important to understand why we are trying to standardize this definition and to what extent we can by using these these three dimensions. Fantastic. Uh, please please go on. Oh, thank you. So um, so I'll start with range, and and the reason we have range, of course, is to for for the um, um, representation dimension. And this is a uh, map of the Javan rhino and the current distribution is this little corner of, of the island here where there is a um, there is a population. Now if we focus if we limit our conservation efforts with the current distribution, we will never be able to call this a recovered uh, species. So what we need is to plan recovery, across its indigenous range, which we define as non or inferred distribution at a temporal benchmark. Now I'll come back to what, what that means. Um, but we also need to consider projected range because again, especially for species whose ranges are shifting with climate change, we cannot restrict our conservation efforts and conservation planning to only the current range. We have to be able to consider and plan for expansion to areas that will become suitable in the future because if we don't do that uh, we won't for for some species we won't have any area left uh, to do conservation in within the current range of the species now the the issue of the temporal benchmark is a is a uh, difficult one and it's actually uh, soon after we we had our paper published um, Eric Sanderson wrote a response uh, and not um, liking our approach to this temporal benchmark issue. Uh, and then we wrote a, a, a reply to that response and then there's another paper coming up. So basically the issue is do we, um, how far you go back in recovering a species is of course kind of a value judgment, but it's mostly a um, kind of um, a level of ambition. The point here is that we want the species to be 
um, not recovered to necessarily, but at least assessed um, with respect to a time before humans were the most important factor in shaping the range of that species. In other words, we want to be able to document the, the extent of human impacts and not fall prey to the, 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 the trap of shifting baselines. So that's the point. Avoiding shifting baselines is the point of this um, inferred range. Now, whether this is a globally fixed benchmark such as 1750, which is used by IPCC as the start of the um, industrialization, um, is, is, is an open question. We, that's what we suggested, but then we are now rethinking this. Perhaps a regional approach is better because different regions are under different levels of threat in different time steps. It might even be a species specific um, approach and we are still considering these, these different options. Um, now, closely related to the issue of range is the part of the range, parts of the range. and the, Again, the reason we have parts of the range is to represent the different ecological settings, conditions, and contexts that the species has occurred in or occurs in. And we decided that the, uh, the best way to do that is to divide the range into spatial units, uh, subdivisions, and these can be based on a number of different criteria. It can be biological criteria such as subpopulations or evolutionary significant units, etc. It can be ecoregions uh, or, or it can be geographic features that are proxies for, for subpopulations. Or it can even be locations uh, because as defined in the red list, locations are um, extents of basically threats that are threatening the species. Um, so that's the second part. And he here are some examples, for instance, for the polar bear, uh, what you see here are the 19 subpopulations that the po polar bear specialist unit has came up with, and these could be used as the basis of these special units. Um, on the right, you see um, a map um, that is um, pr uh, provided as part of the, the testing of the green list, and um, that shows the distribution of this uh, species guanaco in, the, in red. And what we see is that the species exists in different ecoregions. And in, in each ecoregion, there's, there are different sets of species interactions. So that allows uh, that, that dividing the range into these ecoregions would allow to represent the different roles the species has and the different interactions it has in, the, in, in different ecoregions. Um, viable is another of these words. And um, viable also means persistence, resilience, demographic sustainability. These are all used in, in the same um, uh, sense. And we all know the attributes necessary for long-term persistence. Um, the species has to have populations that are large, stable, replicated, healthy, etc. cetera. Um, so, for viability, we decided on a very practical definition. We said that the species um, in each spatial unit should be either least concerned or it should be near threatened and not declining based on the regional guidelines, IUCN red list rules, including the regional guidelines, which incorporate rescue effects. Um, this provides a link with the red list as well as making the assessments much faster because out of the species have already been assessed um, uh, with respect to these criteria. And finally, we have functional. It's one of the more uh, confusing and confused concepts, and it's um, a challenge to address it, but we like a good challenge. Uh, so in the original paper, we said a fully recovered species exhibits the full range of its ecological interactions, functions, and other roles in the ecosystem. Um, there are many examples in the literature of species um, interacting with other species in such a way that they determine the, the community composition, they determine the distribution of other species, they even determine competitive interactions among other species. Um, and there's a long history of considering function, especially in the context of conservation. People have said that we have to conserve not just species, but their interactions and functions. 
However, so far there has not been any explicit or systematic way of using ecological function as a criterion for species recovery. So that's the challenge that, that we took on. And we have a paper in the review. I won't go into the details, but we, and in that paper, we consider ecological function of a species um, from the perspective of the species interactions with other species, its influence on ecosystem processes such as pollination, and um, as well as intraspecific interactions, uh, which are uh, behavioral patterns and social dynamics that are characteristic of that species. Um, I'm sure there, are, there may be that you may have lots of questions on functionality. Um, and for most of them, I'll probably say we are working on it. It's a com com uh, complex topic, but I think we have made uh, good progress in this in this paper that, that is still uh, in review. Now, okay, so those are the dimensions. So what do we do with this? What we do is that in each spatial unit, we assess the state of the species in one of these four states. It's either absent or it is present, but is not viable or functional, or it is viable, but not functional, or it is functional. And we give a weight to all of these, to each of these states. And then we add up these weights across all the spatial units of the species and then divide with the maximum possible. So that is this formula that says we add up the weights in different spatial units and divide with the number of spatial units multiplied with the weight of the functional category. And that gives us the greenness score. Now this score ranges from um, zero when it's absent in all parts of the range, um, extinct or extinct in the wild, to 100 when it is functional in all parts of the range. Um, so what do we do with this, with this score? Well, we calculate it for the current time step. And this already, this very first step is already, I think, a interesting um, development because it puts a number to how far the species is from being fully recovered and how far it is from the ex extinction in terms of representation, functionality, and viability. Um, but we didn't stop there. We have a lot of different things we want to measure. Um, we said, okay, so suppose you did um, the same calculation at an earlier time. And, and then you said that, um, let's say the earlier time is when you started conservation efforts for the species. And you notice that the state has declined. The observed trajectory is going down. Now, does this mean conservation has failed? In one sense, yes, it didn't cause any recovery. It's actually getting worse. But really to know how much conservation contributed, we need to know what would have happened without conservation. So we call that the counterfactual state, the state that we would have observed at the present time if there were no conservation actions in the past. And the difference between two is one of our for conservation metrics that we propose, we call it conservation legacy. It's the impact of past conservation uh, actions. And then we uh, continue this, this uh, counterfactual thinking into the future. And we say, what if we stop all conservation measures now? What would be the state of the species now? And the difference from that to the current state, we call conservation dependence. And then we say, what would happen if we continued conservation and the difference between that and the current state is, is, is conservation gain. Uh, now, for many species, the most you can um, hope for in the long term is to be fully recovered, but for some species, it's not. So we also add a recovery potential metric, which is the uh, difference from the current state to the long-term potential of the species. If we continue conservation in a sustained way, what's the best we can hope for for the species? It can be fully recovered, it can be less than fully recovered. So these are the four conservation metrics. And in our paper, we applied it to uh, four species. Uh, this is the result for, for instance, the, the saiga. And now, um, what I want to clarify is that the IUCN greenest of species will 
basically consists of these four conservation metrics. And the other thing I want to emphasize is that these four conservation metrics can be applied to any species, um, regardless of redness status and population trend. So um, the saiga is, for instance, critically endangered, but uh, it can also be applied to uh, least concerned species and, um, and, and species, whether they are declining or increasing. And it can also be applied to any species, regardless of whether it was or will be the subject of conservation measures. Um, so this is the, the, the general idea about the red list. We have a lot of test assessments going on at this point. As you can see in this um, uh, pie chart on the right, uh, some of these species are threatened, some of them are not threatened, and there are even some that have, have not been evaluated before. Uh, and the test species include vertebrates, invertebrates, uh, plants, and fungi. And we hope that the, the test assessments will be completed in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a month or two. But I want to give a couple of examples of the tests that have been completed, just to give a sense of the type of results that, that we are getting. And these are taken from this um, uh, report that uh, PJ Stevenson completed with funding from National Geographic, uh, applying this uh, to uh, a group of, um, I think about 15 species. So the first one is this, uh, is this uh, butterfly. Um, it um, um, is, is, is currently critically endangered, uh, range includes um, North America. Um, in this case, the conservation legacy is quite small. Um, Without conservation and with conservation, the current state would not be that different. Um, however, it is an important legacy because um, extinction was prevented. In other words, if there were no conservation, indications are that the species would have been extinct. Um, now, for the future, there is no conservation gain. In other words, we don't expect the status of the species will change much with the current conservation efforts in the next 10 years but conservation dependence is very high, um, but small numerically, but high in terms of importance, because again, um, the uh, indications that if there is no conservation, the species will go extinct in the future. Now, compared to this, the second example shows a very different picture. This is a fish that is uh, critically endangered currently. It's in South Africa. Conservation legacy is zero, and past conservation did not make a difference, and uh, future conservation is not expected to make a difference. It's not expected to decline significantly, even if there is no conservation action. But the the different thing about this species is that the conservation gain and potential um, are very high. The, the species could actually recover to 100 percent of um, uh, of, of recovery in, in the future with conservation efforts. Um, so that's, those are two examples. Now, we don't have examples of these types of species, the highly conservation dependent species that, that I mentioned, but I want to um, just come back to these and, and say what their status would look like. And this is a very common case. The um, species improves and there is some controversy because people think that um, improved status will be a cause for cutting conservation funding, um, but, but documenting conservation dependence uh, would actually be a way to, um, to resolve this conflict. So the situation is that the, the um, state is improving, the current state is, is an improvement, but without conservation, it would actually go back to where it was, actually become worse than what it used to be, but with conservation, it can um, become much uh, closer to full recovery. So this is a common state and, and it causes issues under the Endangered Species Act as well. People complain that species should not remain on it because it's already uh, in high numbers. But the problem is that all of those species have high conservation dependence or conservation reliance as, as people call it. Okay, now before I finish, um, I want to uh, talk about three things. Um, um, one is 
uh, the relation of greenness to conservation planning process. Um, uh, I mentioned many, much of this, this connection, of course, but uh, I want to just summarize. Um, first, I want to mention that we don't consider the greenness of species as replacing the conservation planning process uh, because that brings stakeholders together. Rather, we consider it as reflecting the goals and aspirations that are set in the conservation planning process. Um, for instance, conservation plans usually include short-term targets and priorities in time frames of, let's say, five to 20 years, and that will be reflected in the conservation gain uh, metric that, that we propose. Those short-term targets and priorities are often nested within a longer-term vision for the species recovery, and that longer-term vision corresponds to the recovery potential uh, that, that we propose. And of course, these conservation plans are built upon uh, evaluation of past conservation and how successful um, each type of conservation measure was. And that, uh, of course, is related to the conservation legacy metric. And the necessity of con continued conservation and the uh, reliance on measures that are in place right now is reflected in the conservation dependence metric. Um, in addition to these metrics, um, the current greenness score, which is of course the basis of all these metrics, they all start from that point, shows the degree of recovery of the species. And I think that can also be very useful for conservation monitoring, for monitoring the success of conservation um, to uh, follow the, the uh, greenness score and use it as a species recovery index would I think help quantify the degree of, um, of recovery of species through time. Of course, there are many remaining challenges in this, and I mentioned a number of these in my, uh, in my talk already. The temporal bench benchmarks for indigenous range is, um, uh, is an issue that we are working on. Um, we need to develop methods for a lot of the different parts of the greenness process, methods for projected range, for functionality and for developing counterfactual and future scenarios. So those are all methodological issues. And I think all of this will continue for years to come, just like for the red list, uh, we continue to expand the guidelines and add new methods such as climate change projections that can be used for, for red listing. Um, a different set of issues have to do with categorization and communication. Um, categorization means, do we leave these metrics as numerical values or do we put them into categories such as high and medium and low? So that's something that we are currently working on and related to that is how do we actually communicate the results? How do we display them? And one um, idea that has been floated is that they can be used as badges on the red list as as additional information about the status of the species, in addition to its red list uh, status, we have whether uh, how dependent it is on conservation and, and what the level of conservation legacy is. So, um, so these are some of the challenges. And of course, we need to do a lot more testing. But I think um, that despite these challenges, um, the greenness has potential to make some key contributions to conservation science and practice. And among these, I think one of the important ones is the definition of fully recovered, trying to make it as standard as, as possible so that it can be comparable across species. And also using functionality in this definition. Functionality is, I think, important, not, be, not only because it brings ambition to the, to the conservation targets, but it also integrates species and ecosystem levels of conservation. Um, representation um, is also an important um, addition and integrates population and species scales. And both of these, as I mentioned, encourage ambitious and, and objective recovery goals. Um, I could talk about these perverse incentives uh, that result from focusing too much on the status of the species and, and I think the uh, quantification of 
conservation dependent, as I mentioned, will hopefully um, reduce these, these conflicts. And, and, and finally, I think there is something to be said about um, recognizing conservation success. When we talk about biodiversity, we talk usually about bad news. We keep giving bad news to the public and a lot of people not conservation scientists just tune them out because they are they find them too depressing we do have to give those news we do have to warn people of the dire status of the biodiversity crisis but we also give them hope that conservation works and and if, if we do that i think we will be promoting optimism and that will help a lot in terms of gaining support and, 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 and participation of people in conservation. Um, and thank you very much for listening. And um, before I finish, I want to acknowledge uh, the partners in, in, in this process and the funding sources, as well as uh, members of the Green List uh, of Species Task Force. And um, now I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that fantastic presentation. Um, for those who have got a question they'd like to ask, either write it in the chat box just now, and um, you'll be able to, to see that as well, or I can queue it up for you. If you would like to ask your question, then just turn your microphone on, and, uh, and I'll be able to see it, and then I'll um, queue you up. So does... Do you, does anybody, um, Karen, you've got your mic on. Do you want to ask away? Yes. Um, uh, hi, uh, this is Karen Schwartz. I'm a conservation biologist in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. Um, when you consider the recovery uh, potential metrics, uh, I was wondering if um, if you cons would consider a in the one plan approach the uh, the ex situ populations that are under managed care and the programs like uh, the conservation translocations or reintroductions or whatever. But if, is there some, uh, some way to, to include that component of uh, recovery in the recovery potential metrics? Um, I, I think, yes, I, the, the um, recovery potential, but not only the recovery potential, all mm -hmm. of the metrics actually have to do with all different types of conservation. So for instance, um, consider a species that is, um, 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 that is uh, extinct in the wild right now and is only in, in captivity. Um, the only conservation gain we can have with this is through um, continuation of the captive breeding and, and reintroduction into the wild. So um, we are actually considering making sure that um, regardless of the, so, so let, let me back up and, 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 and go to one of the examples. So I, I said in this example that um, even though the, 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 the value of the conservation legacy is small, we consider it as it, it important because otherwise it would have gone extinct. And I think a lot of uh, that can be said for a lot of um, um, X2 conservation uh, programs, as well as for, for conservation dependence and conservation gain. Um, if the species would remain extinct in the wild without conservation or would go extinct without conservation, regardless of the, um, the value of that the metric, I am promoting, we, we haven't yet decided, but I am advocating for this within the uh, species, within, within our task force, that that um, species should be considered, that value should be considered high. It, it should have a, whatever we, way we um, promote it, with a high badge or whatever, that we should highlight that species as um, being highly dependent on conservation in the past or in the future. So there is definitely a lot of scope, but, um, I'm sure that um, other parts of um, that that will uh, come up. Um, actually, even in the red list, we recently made a change to the red list guidelines 
to um, take into account X2 populations. Um, it's just in the uh, version that was uh, recently released. So I'm sure as, as time goes on, as, as we learn about uh, different um, experiences from different um, applications of this framework to different species, you will add other ways of, of incorporating that. But if you have other ideas of how we can uh, we, we can consider these, um, please let us know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, uh, Oni had a, a question about how you envisage um, this process going forward um, in terms of how you know the sort of practicalities of it being applied. Do you imagine there being like a a, a, a green list unit with trained assessors and, and you know sort of process being rolled out that people can learn how to do or is or is it too early to say what that might look like? Um, it is a bit early to say but I would like to speculate anyway. Um, so our experience is that um, the, uh, for species for which there is a red list assessment, the red list assessors um, uh, can do the green list assessment very fast, much faster than someone who has not done the red list assessment. And be that's because a lot of the information about the range and the status of the species is already known to these people. Um, so I think that the, the starting point would not be a separate red list, um, separate green list unit, but a, a green list um, person in the red list unit that is coordinating the green list assessments through the red list uh, authority coordinators. Um, now, the red list authorities often need help and expertise and guidance on specific aspects of assessments. One example of this is climate change. Um, there, there are, of course, guidelines about how to use climate change in the red list, um, but, but this requires special expertise. And this will be the same for greenness, that there will be climate change related aspects. So what um, uh, we are doing in the climate change specialist group is developing training materials to help red list assessors do these on, on their own much more efficiently. So my guess is that um, there will be a similar role, I hope, for the conservation planning community to contribute uh, to that aspect of the green list process. And that's just one of the contributions that, that the conservation planning community can make, which is to, to do, develop, um, help develop guidance about how to um, especially develop the, um, the, the target setting and the, um, and the future scenarios for um, uh, under different conservation um, settings. Thanks very much for that. Um, Lala, whilst you didn't, well, while Lala didn't have a, a question, um, was making the point that uh, you know the green list creates a lot of awareness and concern, particularly when you've got species that you know you may have been working with for decades, and there may not be huge amount of positive change, but recognizing that without that investment, there you know there could be very much you know, a great deal of negative change. So there may be benefit for these long-term projects that, that seem to take a long time to, you know, to, to get to where you know people ideally want to get them to. Um, Kerry had a question that was to do with. I'm going to read it out. Uh, in fact, you might be able to see it anyway, um, Rizit. Um, so Kerry saying related to setting priorities for conservation investment within developing a species conservation action plan. Do you advise that the spatial unit assessment process within the greenness scoring process be used to help rank and prioritize these units um, within the species range for potential conservation investment? Quite a lot going on in there, but um, hopefully yeah, you're able yeah. to respond better than I could. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. So the um, the, the, the we have a um, working group within the task force that is looking into the relationship between spatial units and the possibility of project level assessments. And there are some difficulties because um, obviously um, redness and greenness are starting from the species level. But uh, yes, the, the, um, the, one of the points of dividing into spatial units 
is that, of course, different conservation actions occur in different areas. There are different action plans, there are different um, um, levels of investment in different parts of a species um, um, range. Uh, but, but the specific question about um, whether that process is used to rank and prioritize, we haven't actually considered ranking the spatial units. But of course, as a result of the green list assessment process, there will be different, um, you know, different state for each spatial unit. As I mentioned, both current and future um, states um, uh, will be assessed for each spatial unit. So that can be used, I, I guess, but I, I haven't thought about it. So I don't want to say anything more about that. <laughs> No problem at all. Uh, I know Kerry's got a lot on her plate with, with pangolins, and so, uh, so I imagine that when, when you have had a chance to think about it, they might, that Kerry may well be at the point where she's ready to, to, to come back to you, because I know there's a lot to do in terms of trying to monitor and understand what's going on with, with, with pangolins. Um, Harry was also asking um, specifically around tools for understanding and determining the counterfactual. Um, are you able to help with any pointers there? Um, a, a little bit. So um, that is um, th again we have a we have a um, um, working group within the task force that is reviewing the the types of methods that can be used for um, developing counterfactual scenarios. And um, there are actually papers that um, we refer to in our framework paper that have been that have attempted. Um, counterfactuals uh, in terms of red list status only. Um, there's a there's a paper by Mike Hoffman and others about ungulates that look at um, what the red list status of the species would have been without the um, without the protected areas in in their range, and that is the sort of um, an, uh, the sort of methods that can be used. For instance, you can say, okay. What would have happened if this protected area was not established? Um, you look around the um, landscape um, that is outside the protected area, and you say perhaps a similar level of transformation would have happened within the protected area. You make that transformation and you recalculate the, the, the habitat suitability of the species and the resulting range and carrying capacity. Um, maybe using some sort of species distribution model. And that will be, for instance, one way of quantifying what the effect would, uh, was for, for, for establishing that, uh, that conservation area. So that is the sort of thing um, that, that we are considering. Um, there is a set of papers that um, actually look at counterfactuals in environmental assessments generally. And these usually involve comparing areas um, that um, are similar in all respects, except for the conservation aspect. So that's called a uh, matched comparison, um, but it's, it's rather difficult it requires a lot of data, um, you know, to have different populations in, on, on, in different areas, but that's another, that's another possibility of doing it. Um, there are also more quantitative methods. You can, for instance, use population models, and we have used population models before for species and, and ran them in a counterfactual way to see what would have happened. So basically what you do is you have a model of the species that is declining, right? So you apply it, you start it from, from the past, and then you say, okay, now I'm going to take away the effect of hunting. I know how much um, it was hunted or harvested in the past. I'll take away that from this population model. Um, and that's how we do impact assessment for current. Now you can do the same in the reverse direction. You can say hunting was regulated during this time. What would have happened if it were not regulated? Uh, okay, it was not regulated in this X area. So I assume a, level, a similar level of hunting would have happened. So I add that to the model, and that uh, model then gives me what the counterfactual current state would be uh, with, without the regulation of hunting. So those are the 
type of things that we are considering. Um, but but it's a, it's an ongoing. I I think that is one of the um, parts of the guidance that will hopefully develop and and get more sophisticated over time. Um, thank you for that. There's one more question from from Molly, which comes back to this point around and values um, and the idea of setting of the, these objective recovery goals, and and how do they then account for planning that often involves a sort of social and political element to it? Um, and so there are there are other. Um, uh, ideas or definitions of success that go more into the socio-political and maybe economic realm, but they're still around the species. It just goes beyond the the, the specific biological um, status of the species. And I wonder how how you how they sort of fit together. Um, I think that those considerations have to be part of the assessment of the. Um, the, the conservation gain and conservation potential. How much you expect the species to gain in terms of representation and functionality, especially in the near future, must be considered in the context of and with the constraints of social and, econ and economic factors. There is no way around it. So I think we have to know those uh, factors. We have to take them into account when we are making these uh, these assessments in other words these these um, predictions of 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 conservation gain these are not just wishful thinking of i hope that it will be functional and representative in 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 you know 80 percent of the populations no these are um, assessments of based on the current conservation actions that we have and we have planned for the near future and considering all the social, economic, and other constraints, where do you think the species will be in the near future? So I think those are very important and must be part of this assessment. And, and I suppose, you know, if one was thinking about, you know, the, where, where one often develops is to helping people to develop visions, the, the recovery element that could be captured through Greenlist is something that deals with an aspect of that vision, but it doesn't preclude elements of sort of cultural or social significance and or or, or political significance being wrapped up in uh, a, a kind of broader definition of success to, uh, that you know that that can still be recognized as being important i.e it's not just the recovery of the species or the recovery of the species within its system but that system also involves people and things that they might care about which goes beyond which will often go beyond um, the, the, the the species it, it, it itself or its biological nature. Um, but I suppose there's space there for these other bits to come in within things like visioning processes. Would you say? Um, I, I I I don't know. Um, I haven't thought much about that aspect. In other words, um, so, so just like the red list. There is always a social and economic context, and 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 the not only the um, the the conservation of the species is affected by the by what status we say it is, um, but other things are affected as well. For instance, people are not allowed to hunt it anymore, and, and things like that. Now, our goal in the red list has always been that. The, the, the status is a objective assessment of the extinction risk. We do not consider the consequences of what will happen if we call that a species an endangered species. We only say, based on the current trends, if the current threats and conservation actions continue, this species has an extinction risk that is consistent with being endangered in the endangered category. So. I think that is that um, is still important, and I think that for greenness as well, we have to separate these these components. The greenness, I think, would be a lot more credible if it is seen as an objective assessment of the future potential of the species for recovery, um, and of course taking into account social and and economic constraints, but not worrying about. 
um, whether it's an important species or not. And, and that's a critical thing. Out of the reaction that we get when we say we, we need to consider the function of the species is that people accuse us for discriminating against species that um, are not important in some one way or the other. And, and that is not our intent at all. Our point of including functionality is only to make our own conservation plans more ambitious. It, is not, it has nothing to do with whether the species performs a function that we, we find important. So um, I think that, uh, uh, for, for in that case as well, we have to separate the human perception of what is important and what is not from an objective assessment of uh, what is po possible for, for the recovery of the species. Of course, this is a very, it can be a very contentious discussion and it sometimes becomes very contentious in the context of Red List. So um, I look forward to many discussions on this topic in the future. I feel like you're setting yourself up for like a Marvel sort of Hollywood series of films where this is round one and then, you know, then this is the first, the first session, then there's going to be the, the second opportunity for people to interact over this and, uh, and want to know what, you know, obviously have, have thoughts on how it's developing. It's a hugely exciting development and can see massive um, value in it. And so um, I'm, I'm definitely grateful that people are thinking about this. Uh, I'm looking forward to engage with um, with you and others over this process. Um, Reza, thank you so much for giving your time for this talk. Um, we will be, this, this talk has been recorded um, and uh, we'll put it onto the CPSG website and it may be to, uh, maybe on Monday now when it goes up, it depends how long it takes to download and go through. Um, but we'll make sure that this goes up on the website. And um, Reza, you said as well that you might be able to produce a, uh, a, a PDF version that we could perhaps sit alongside the, the webinar and maybe we could put that up as well because I'm sure there'd be lots of people who would be interested. Yes, I'll, I'll have a, a PDF version that will have um, uh, hyperlinks to the papers and other uh, resources that, that you can use to follow up on, on the developments. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. Um, everybody have a very good weekend uh, and we will sign off just now. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Bye bye everyone.